Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Nick, but before we get into who he is and what we're going to be talking about, I just want to say that uh, we missed a month of publishing episodes for two very simple reasons. The first one is I had to let go of the video editor during that time. Uh, we actually recorded 109 to 112, and uh, this episode is 113. And after I let him go, I got COVID. So I wasn't able to look for a new video editor, and I didn't have the energy to do any of the editing myself. Uh, but now we're back on track. 109 and uh, 110, 11, 12 were also released, so uh, we're back on track. So you're not here for me, though. You're here for Nick, so let's talk about him. Nick Johnson is the co-founder and managing director of Executives Global Network in Singapore, which creates confidential peer groups for founders and high-powered executives to learn, share, and grow with each other. He's also the co-founder and CEO of EGN Indonesia, and they're in the process of opening up the Malaysian market as of this recording. Nick is also a keynote speaker, a writer, a certified professional executive coach. He's completed the Ironman. He's supporting the suicide prevention hotline in Singapore as a fundraiser and volunteer. And if I keep going, you're going to stop believing me that Nick is real. So let's get into the episode. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Nick. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about EGN, and then we'll go from there. Fantastic, Sean. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with in uh, We Live to Build. So yeah, Executive Global Network, what do we do there? It's uh, confidential peer groups, and some people might even ask, what is this? Well, you know, if you're an executive, you probably heard uh, the saying that can be lonely at the top. And uh, many times as a senior executive, perhaps you don't have someone to discuss your work-related challenges with. Someone might sign up for a coach or a mentor and working with them, but uh, many times it's good to hear it also for someone else like yourself who is in a sen senior role, perhaps at the same level. So that's what we do. We create these confidential peer groups, or you can almost say that it's a bit like a mastermind group. And our job then at EGN is to do all the administration, facilitation and moderation. So we provide certified facilitators for these discussions and the members then bring in the work related challenges and we make sure that they leave with some solution. All right, great. Thank you very much for that. And as you were saying that I was nodding along and you could probably see uh, just how important something like this is. I can't tell you how many times in the last four and a half years since I started my tech company that I just sometimes feel like I just wish there was someone who could just listen to my problems. That's not a therapist. Um, because a lot, like I, I, I have tried talking with a therapist and they're at such a different level that they just think, how are you like alive? Like how, how are you possibly able to handle all of the crap that you're telling me about? And it's, it's almost like we, we blow their minds away with like how many problems we're juggling. Um, and I'm glad that you said it's like a mastermind because I was going to ask is, you know, what's the difference? So what made you want to get involved with something like this? You know, there's so many mastermind groups happening in this, but what happens, it tend to be on an ad hoc basis that someone is excited. They get together a few people and they have a great first session. Then the next session comes along and then only half show up and then it never happens again. So the whole thing here is that it's about making it happen. And in order to do that, you need a team, you need a structure in place and it needs CRM system. You need a mobile app in this case where members can sign up and, you know, they can post queries to each other between sessions. There's follow ups. There's people who are responsible because we're talking here about a senior executives or we have group for business owners and founders and everyone is too busy. Someone need to be in charge of this and making sure that it's an ongoing program. And that's why there's a place for someone like us to do that. And there's many more organizations out there now. And peer groups is becoming sort of the new way to network because I'm sure, Sean, you, you've been to some like Chamber of Commerce events, other networking events. And what is happening there is that you have all these salespeople instead. You have the insurance salespeople, uh, or even recruiters running around trying to sell the services. And people get so turned off by this. So in EGN and then here in these peer groups, it's all about knowledge exchange. Everyone has to sign a non-disclosure agreement so that you, it's, com it's confidential. You have no competitors in your group, and there's a strict policy that you're not allowed to sell to each other. So this turns an, 
away all the people who's coming there with an initiative of just selling. And instead here, we create a culture of helping each other. I love those base rules. I think that's really good. And I, I did try to organize two masterminds in the past, one in China and one uh, online. Uh, so the one in China was in 2014 among friends. And that failed pretty fast because I found that the other people that I was with, they they were like me. We were all aspiring to start our own companies, but I was the only one actually like making progress week after week. And so I said, well, you know, they just, they're not putting in the effort, so forget it. And uh, the other one, uh, I felt like the people I was with, they had done seven figure businesses before and they were kind of like, they had put them down and they wanted to start something new. And we all kind of wanted to get into coaching, but I found that I was more helpful to them than they were to me. And uh, then one of the guys dropped off and yeah, it fell apart within three weeks. Uh, so I definitely, I have tried multiple times to put together masterminds and even after spending a lot of time trying to study how they work, they're not easy to put, to, to put together and to keep together. So the fact that you've been able to, you, you have what, 800 people in Singapore alone? Yes, almost 800 in Singapore now. And we launched Indonesia earlier this year. We have close to 50 there and Malaysia is just being rolled out now. And we hope to have 30, 50 something like that by end of the year. So indeed, people are moving to, it's about quality these days, quality relationships. It's it's about really, you know, feeling that you have this trusted space, you have a trusted network with people who actually are meaningful and can help you again, rather than selling to you. Yeah, I want to go back to that selling point. It's It's extremely important. I did Chamber of Commerce meetings in Florida when I went back to visit my family once. And I felt like it wasn't business owners, it was like their salespeople. And when I was in China, I would go to the American chamber, the Canadian chamber, the British, French chambers. I went to all the chambers. And mostly it was like, oh yeah, we're going to sell wine. Do you want to buy wine? Like it was, they were business owners, but they were there for a purpose and that was to promote their business. It wasn't about building friendships. Um, but then again, you know, China is very transaction oriented as a society. Um, and so I didn't... I didn't mind that because I was there to network, right? I was trying to find guests for my uh, my events that I was, you know, having these uh, these offline speech events, things like that. Um, so I was there for a purpose as well, but but I wasn't selling them something for money. I was trying to get their attention to do something um, for me or to see if there was something I could do to connect them to other people in my network to help them sell, things like that. Um, but yeah, after a while, it, I felt like these people were looking, they, they were positioning themselves probably a bit higher than they, they were. And so I, I felt like going there and talking to them was a waste of time as well. Um, so yeah, having that kind of environment where it's it's not about the sale, but about the support is really good. And I, I've talked to someone, uh, Vladimir Gendelman, I did a, an episode with him and, and he's a member of EO. I know you and I talked about EO um, offline. Uh, what's like the biggest difference between EGN and, and EO, other than the fact that you also have executives? because I know they're just founders. Yes, that's right. EO is for the founders and our core market is really all the executives. Uh, but also EO has uh, some quite challenging barriers, including the revenue of the company and so on. And if, if, we are also for new founders. So if you're just starting up a business, we also have almost for solopreneurs, we have a group here in Singapore now, now for them, you know, who do you ask them? Who do? You, what's your network? Even if you perhaps is a founder and you get some, money into your bank account uh, and but then you have a board is putting on pressure on you to deliver who do you then talk to to get that support and we are there for those as well and they have been very very lonely especially during the pandemic yeah i also work with solopreneurs and there's definitely a massive need a lot of them feel like they're really burnt out or they're maxed out they're not really able to do much more than they they are right now so um, having this kind of a, a peer network for them is extremely important you, you've hit on something very very important there um, so because these executives and these founders are so busy, how do you get them to commit besides obviously paying, you know, having, having a yearly fee, they're going to take it more seriously, but how do you get them to actually commit and how much time do they usually have to commit to in a given week? It's a yearly membership and it's six sessions in a year for four hours. So that's half a day. And we block these in the calendar one year in advance. So the key here is that it's, challenged, uh, it, it's booked in a year in advance and shared with everyone so you can block it in advance. And if you think about it, it's three full days a year 
And these are very important sessions. And we're always asking them, is this a membership that you sponsor yourself or is your company sponsoring it? If you're paying for it by yourself, then make sure that you take annual leaves so that no one touches this. This is your product because you want to have this for yourself to grow your network, to grow yourself. If the company have asked you, if your boss have asked you to join here, then it should be easier to manage it because then just make sure you block this, the slots and tell your boss that you're going there to these sessions and uh, make sure that you really protect it in the calendar. That's the first thing to do. And then we send out the invitation for each session six weeks before. And it's normally uh, some pre-readings and uh, some engagement leading up to the session. And uh, we always try to have also one member every time in what we call a hot seat or to get the use of the advisory board where you really lay out an issue that is happening in your business, something that's happening. It could even be if you're in a founders group, perhaps you present your exit plan or exit strategy, and then the rest of the group can ask questions and give you feedback and input. So in that sense, you know, people should feel excited about it, engaged uh, uh, leading up to it, but also that it's protected in the calendar. And by doing that, we have good attendance numbers. You said it's was six sessions in the year? Six half day sessions in the year face to face. Yes. Is that enough to really, because it, it, it feels like it's, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm just curious here because the, the masterminds that I've tried to arrange or tried to be a part of, they're more like once a week or once every other week. What, why? Why does that work? Why less sessions being better, do you think? Well, if we're talking about the senior executives, they're so busy. It's quite a big commitment already for them to spend three days of a year in this. But the, most of the communication is in between the meetings. The whole time also online on the members app. They, if they're sitting at the desk right now and they need to recruit the new staff in Jakarta, they might ask, okay, who's worked with a recruitment agency? You can recommend it here. Uh, the next question might be, uh, we're now working on our expansion to Vietnam. Who knows something about an employee manual in Vietnam? And by the way, I need to know about transfer pricing between Singapore and Vietnam. Uh, who can link me with someone who knows about that? So it's communication the whole time. And it's when they get together, then six times is the peer group meeting. There's also social gatherings, uh, coffee mornings. And this week we had a, a networking evening also. So there's all kind of events around it, social things happening as well okay now that makes a lot more sense because like so for the for the coaching that i do my concept is okay you'll get a call once a week but then you can also send me messages like if it's like urgent like oh you've got some some fire that you don't know how to handle like so having that ability for the entrepreneurs and the executives to be able to communicate with each other outside of those messages or outside of those meetings is is like that makes a lot more sense because that networking aspect is really important. Um, I know for a fact, because I'm in multiple entrepreneur communities, one I paid for, uh, one I didn't pay for. And pretty much all day, it's like, hey, does anyone know anything about Facebook ads? Uh, I need someone to, you know, I need to hire a manager to do my ads for this business. Or uh, does anyone know about, um, you know, selling a SaaS business? I need to sell my business. So, So those are, I think, like extremely, extremely valuable is that networking, that, that ability to network daily for sure. What told you that that was something important? You know, what, what gave you that idea to do that part, that additional part? It's our partners at EGN in uh, Europe who developed an app over many years and they've done it by questioning and asking the members what is it uh, that they want to communicate about. And we create also a lot of sub uh, groups inside here. We have, for example, for the ones who are interested in uh, ESG environment, we have diversity and inclusion groups. We have a lot of social groups, food lovers, wine uh, lovers, where, where they can have wine tastings. We have a cycling group, we have a running group and so on. And we're going to run Singapore Marathon together. And what is happening then, Sean, is uh, while we have 20 peer groups in Singapore now, a lot of this is also cross-group activities uh, because it doesn't have to be a confidential event when you go and run a marathon. So we can mix and, and the groups come together and you meet from uh, other networks as well. So that's the beautiful part of this. That's really cool because I, when I was talking with, with Vladimir, he was saying that EO has similar things, but they don't have a structure to actually manage it. And so... Um, I, I love how they figured out how to do that. So you said that, that EGN's created its own app for all of this? Yes, it's called Members Universe. And we have almost 15,000 members now globally. 
uh, about 800 in Singapore. So you can also connect with other members if you have a business trip to Hong Kong or you're going to Germany, then you can go in and see who are the members there and connect with them. And what we have learned is that people really have this mindset of trying to help each other and being of service to each other. So in that sense, it's quite valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. This this sounds really cool. If I was in Asia, I would probably be a member. Um, th this is something because like when I was in China, when I was in Vietnam, espe especially in Vietnam, I felt very lonely in terms of the fact that there weren't many entrepreneurs in Saigon. Maybe there were more in Hanoi. I don't really know. But my experience was I was pretty much alone in, in Saigon for four years. And, um, and it sucked because I wanted to be involved in the local kind of entrepreneurship community, but there was a disconnect between the Vietnamese and the expats in terms of entrepreneurship, where the expats were thinking at a regional or a global level and the locals were thinking at a local level. And a lot of the locals couldn't speak English. So there was really no way to get uh, this kind of, you know, cross-pollination of ideas and, and friendships going. Um, and I think having something like that would have made it a lot better. Yes, I, I completely agree with you. I lived in Vietnam a few years myself, so I, I agree with you, Sean. It, it was not easy there, the inter integration there and the interaction. What we have seen in Singapore is different, of course. Uh, all the locals also speak uh, good English, at least in the business world. And actually, f half of our members now that are joining us are locals. So that have all changed in the last five, six years. You mentioned to me that you bought into this business model, right, for Southeast Asia. Are you able to talk about the process at all of like of buying into it and, and kind of what made you specifically like this idea, uh, th this this business and um and all of that and what it's like to run the business here yeah sure so uh, i joined uh, actually almost seven years ago but i started in business development and sales uh for singapore then selling uh, memberships uh, for the peer groups and so on uh, and i was actually doing it remotely from the beginning from vietnam into singapore uh, then the opportunity came up uh, to relocate to singapore and i had already fallen in love with a business model uh, so it was in sales, business development at the start. And then down the line, uh, I also had a chance to take over the operation. And then during the pandemic, the chance came that the, the, the business model then evolved and they wanted to have a franchise owner uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so I was quick to raise my hand to then acquire the franchise rights for uh, Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. So Singapore was already existing and new markets rolled out now are than Indonesia and Malaysia. Because you have experience with Vietnam, have you thought about expanding it into Vietnam as well? Yes, we are talking about that and it might come uh, 2024. Many businesses operate in a single market or they operate in a way that it, it's global. The fact that you have presence in three countries that are fair, fair enough, they're like really easy to get between. You know, you can fly from Singapore to KL in like 30 minutes and I assume to Jakarta and like 70 um, or less. What's it like running a business across three countries? And do you travel between them or how does that work? A lot of the foundation work is done online these days, but uh, I do travel at least uh, once a month is my plan to travel to each market and join some key events. Uh, I will go to KL this month. Uh, for an info event for members, uh, sorry, for potential members who are interested in joining and also a press conference. We will have the official press conference in KL by end of this month. So I will be there for that and media interviews and so on. And so it is possible these days uh, with a bit of a hybrid world for myself in running the business and also for the members. The value for the members is, of course, increasing when we're adding more countries because not only do we have then the local chapters meeting and the local members meeting cross groups, but also cross countries. So we have now regional meetings and events. And one core product that we have is called uh, uh, developing markets, where we are looking at one country every quarter uh, in you know, how to set up a business there. And a bit what I know you did in Vietnam also there, where you were supporting uh, founders and so on. 
so that is the, the role we're trying to play in the region as well. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I love the idea of, of connecting the entrepreneurs between the countries. So, for example, if I were a member of Singapore and I was going to KL, I could just say, hey, Nick or whoever is, is in charge of, of the Singapore chapter, hey, I'm going to be going to KL. Can you connect me with the people there? And if there was a local meeting, they could go to that meeting or... Yes, we have that capability as well. Indeed. We had members actually coming in uh, from Malaysia, for example, here for the event we had on Wednesday night here at Intercontinental. We had over 100 members in total meeting up for that uh, networking evening. Cool. Yeah, I, I really love this. I, When I was doing my offline events in China... I had an idea to build an app and and have the people be across the country because we actually had fans all over China, but we only had the capacity to serve Shenzhen um, in terms of offline events, even though we had offers from private companies and government officials of other provinces to come and, and organize. And we're just like, we, we just don't have a means to do it. We don't have a team. We don't have enough revenue. Like there was just no way to do it. Um, but this, this seems like a, a really, really interesting um, business model. I think connecting, connecting people, you know, I, I, there's two things that really make up my personality, my identity. One is being an educator and the other is being a connector. I think those two things are, are really important um, because everyone wants to learn and everyone wants to connect. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And, and again, it's about building those relationships and maintain them and always looking at how can you be of service and not what, just what you can get out of it. It's uh, quite a lot of people who approach networking we'd always see okay i pay for this membership and then i just sit back and see what it gives you that's not how it works it's all about coming in and being of service and supporting each other so can you speak to some of the things that i i know that everyone signs ndas but are there anything any trends or things that you're hearing people talking about within your your community that are interesting at a geopolitical level or in some way, you know, like, so I know like there, people are talking about recessions and, and depressions in, in the West, right? But is there this concept in, in Asia right now? Are they thinking about recession and depression? Like are, what, what kind of things are they talking about? Well, I would say clearly the biggest challenge is the talent, hiring the right talent. And even if you find them to getting the right work permits, you know, not only in Singapore, but in all the countries around it is obviously protecting the local talent. So it's quite challenging to hire the talent you want and perhaps import them. Can you get the work permits and passes for them and so on? Uh, so that's a challenge. And getting the, the talent locally up at the skills level do you want it, that's a big challenge. So it's a lot of recruitment and placing people all over the world, scattered all over the world. People are working online. Uh, that is the new world we are seeing. We, we know that, for example, Areas like Bali and Phuket are booming now. Many people are relocating there if they can because it's cheaper rent. It's easier perhaps to set up a company. Uh, Bali has launched a five-year uh, working visa for people uh, that can easily get a work permit and, and visa to live there. We hear from countries like Estonia where you now can live anywhere in the world and become a resident uh, in Estonia anyway and pay tax there. Uh, this that's the new world we're seeing and a lot of communication and talks are around that we hear companies now who say that uh, well we still have our office in Singapore but if someone resigns we're not going to replace them there we replace this person working remotely in a country where it's uh, cheaper for us to station this person so it's a lot of talk around that and this is changing the world I think uh, as we know it forever Sean before the pandemic Singapore the people I talked to in Singapore were very adamant about having physical offices and having their employees in those offices in Singapore or in, in Malaysia or in Vietnam, because I was also involved with companies in all of the countries in, in Southeast Asia there. I'm glad that they're starting to get the hint that things need to change. My tech company is incorporated in Singapore, actually. And we don't have an office and none of our employees are Singaporean. And so for us, not having an office anywhere in the world, if we replace someone, we don't really care where they are. They just conform to Singapore time. You hear more about this the whole time. And this is the founders, you know, always looking at where can we cut cost? And if you're, if you're starting up small and 
you have X amount of money. You can get 10 staff in Indonesia or two, three sitting in Singapore. Uh, that's a big difference. Yeah, I know we had this issue because uh, you, if you hire a Singaporean, you have to pay ta- like social tax and you have to give them like a 13th month, right, for a bonus. Um, and you have to give them specific holidays. And we're like, we, we don't want to do any of that. That's a hassle. So we're just going to not hire Singaporeans, even though we're a Singaporean company. But to be fair, that also backfired because the government was offering support, financial support. So first they offered grants and they, they were offering support for salaries during the pandemic. But we couldn't get any of it because we didn't have an office. We didn't have Singaporeans. And as a non-Singaporean, we didn't. We, we need to have like 30 percent, uh, like Thirty percent of the equity has to be held by a Singaporean, which we didn't have that. So we we had a lot of the benefits of Singapore law and, and structure, but none of the benefits. Right. Yeah. That you need to be on the ground and having the locals. That's what that's what it is, and that's what I mean. The whole world is getting more uh, trying to protect uh, what we have and protect our own, uh, but at the same time, it's getting more global and people working from home and therefore it doesn't really matter where they work because you connect on zoom or on teams or whatever you work anyway so i think it's a losing battle for countries trying to protect it when you can just base them anywhere anyway tell me about iron man you did that last year right i did one actually in august also this year and a full distance this year uh, this one particular one this year was uh, postponed twice. I signed up for this race in 2019. I trained for it a year until 2020. Due to COVID, it was postponed to 2021. I trained another year and then it got postponed again. So I had no, re- no excuse not to be fit now. Having trained, I think I calculated, I trained 1,090 days for this race I did last week. What did you learn about yourself training up to the day of the race? Well, it's, uh, it's about self-discipline, right? It's about to see if you can hold things together for so long, in this case, over 1,000 days and getting up early. And I'm trying always to do as little impact on family, friends, and, and my wife especially. So what I do, I train in the morning. And I trained about 20 hours a week. So that's three hours a day in average. That means I'm up 4 a.m., training 4 to 7 a.m. normally, typically. And that means I then shower, have a breakfast, and I'm ready for the day. And then I'm feeling great about myself. I feel I've done something. I had my own time. I've been having sort of my meditation, my quiet time for myself. And uh, yeah, it's been a great way to keep fit. And also it kept my focus during the pandemic. I really, really didn't think much about pandemic. I I didn't get too frustrated with it. I, I was just training and moving on with life as it was. What did you expect about the race? that you had totally wrong that you discovered on the day of? I've done some races in the past years and I learned a lot from those failures. And one failure in the past was that I didn't have a coach. Uh, I mean, we get coaches in business, we get coaches when we need something. I also realized I needed a coach here and I hired a coach for this particular race who trained me since January. So I had for the first time in my life uh, this uh, last week then my perfect race. It was just wonderful he trained me so well and uh, otherwise i would have had so much stumble so much fall uh, uh yeah finally the perfect day so i they say that you an ironman event you know it's a, a it's such a full race full race that it takes 16 plus hours for many people i had my personal best before was 12 28 i now did it in 10 hours and 41 minutes so that's for me is a perfect race wow so what was the hardest thing about the race the hardest thing was obviously yeah the training leading up to it the nerves before uh worrying about the weather it looked like the forecast that it's going to be cold and rainy and i'm living in singapore the race was in europe in north europe in sweden so i was worried it was going to get cold and uh, you know if it's raining and you're out on a bicycle in 10 15 degrees i was worried i was going to get cold but then in in the end It was a sunny day and uh, everything, as I said, was beautiful. What did you learn about yourself after completing the race? I learned that, yeah, don't don't try to do things alone. Uh, In this case, I had a coach. uh, That's why it felt so great. And once I was racing, I I was quite relaxed this day and I enjoyed uh, the slogan for the race was race with a smile on. And I I really did that. I really uh, smile. I remind myself to smile and enjoy myself. I'd worked hard for it. So. I deserve to have a great day. So 
I think one key learning here is that yeah, try to have more fun in what we do. Many times, uh, it's also with work, we're too serious. Perhaps we take ourselves too serious. We should stop and uh, see if we can have more fun in our day as well. I definitely uh, fall prey to that sometimes, for sure. I try to arrange like fun time. So, for example, uh, before our, our interview today, I. Uh, watched me time on netflix is it's a recent movie that came out with uh kevin hart now i'm going to spend the rest of the day working because i had my fun already i'm the same i tend to work too much also i guess you know that's the thing right being a high achiever we want to deliver and uh, we are the the best cheerleader but we also the the best person perhaps to complain and say oh you can do better come on or you have you have to do it so i have to remind myself also to let go sometimes and I, I need to take some mini breaks, uh, even if it's not going on holiday, I need to block sometimes and just go out for a walk or go for a foot massage or do something just to break the break up the pattern. Yeah, I did that yesterday. I was I was having a lot of anxiety. So I decided I'm just not going to work the rest of the day. This was like it. I like tw- like noon. I was like, oh, screw it. I can't like today is just not a day. I'm, just, I'm not going to work. And I ended up I heard about this place in Lisbon where you, there's a bridge and there's only one way to, or there's two ways to get up the bridge. One is to pay like 20 euros and wait for an hour for all the other people to get up the elevator. The other is to go through a church that's behind the street that tourists don't know about. And I went up there and it was like really beautiful, but I didn't want to go home. I had nothing else to do. I was looking out from the bridge and I saw this rooftop cafe that I had never seen before. And I was like, oh, that looks great. And I just walked over there and I literally just sat there for like two or three hours, just sitting there looking out from the rooftop bar. It was it was like a beautiful day, it was quite nice and, and the weather was beautiful. And so, yeah, it's important to kind of go off script and not have a plan sometimes. Be like, oh, that sounds great. Let's do that. That's interesting. Oh, what's, what's going on over there? As I was walking to the church to get up to the bridge, this group of tourists were like, hey, can you take a picture of us? And I was like, okay, sure. And I took a picture and they're like, oh my God, that's like such an amazing picture. It got the bridge from below. And so, yeah, just like the randomness of life can be really fun and interesting. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, also for me, I had it so structured with the training, the work, everything is there. The, you fall into the routines. So, yeah, so break that is, is fantastic as well. I agree. I've been working on trying to be more structured in my days because in the past I might work on things that are, they, they feel good that they're getting done, but maybe they're not the highest importance of things that need to get done. Right. The, this difference of working in the business versus working on the business. And so I've been trying to structure my days that the first few hours of actual work is where I'm thinking about how to further the business. And then after that, it's like, okay, well, what can I do to learn something? So I might read for an hour and then, okay, what are some things that will further work inside of the business? So that way, like, it's like you, you train in the morning in order to make sure that you keep your body in you know, shape for the next race or whatever you do. Uh, I've been trying to create this structure and it seems to be really, really helpful, actually. Do you have a structure for your work day outside of the training? Yes, I, I'm very structured as well, Sean. And I read a book called Eat That Frog with Brian Tracy. I'm not sure if you heard about it, but he, he and there's a children's version of it as well, which I gave to my son. And it's really good. It's about making that list and making it quite clear and, and really start your day with that task, which you want to procrastinate about the thing that you don't want to do, get it done first. And they, they say for children, for example, if you can get the children to start making the, the bed in the morning, then, you know, they've done the first thing, then the rest of the day hopefully also fall into place if you just did the first thing that you almost wanted to procrastinate. So do you make your bed every day? I do, unless my wife does it. Yeah, I don't like to leave a mess around me, ideally. I've had this idea for a long time. It's like, why should I make my bed? Because I'm just going to get back into it. I'm just going to mess it up again. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully you don't have too many visitors then. Is there anything that we didn't really touch upon that is important to you that you would love to talk about? Well, I think, uh, yeah, outside of EGN, and as you mentioned before, I'm a fundraiser and volunteer for a suicide prevention agency. So what I do quite a lot outside of my work is that I try to put back uh, some time into the society and the community There's been a lot of people going through a difficult time during the pandemic. I had a good time uh, through the pandemic, but I also went through a 
crisis a few years before that when I went through a divorce, I resigned from a job, I moved country and I found myself in a quite lonely place. I got depressed, I started to consume a little bit too much alcohol for my own good during this time and it became an issue. Uh, I came out of this and I kept it secret for quite some time. But then down the line, I looked back at this and I realized this could have gone uh, pretty bad. And uh, just when I was reflecting on this, a friend of mine died of suicide. And that's when I decided to speak up about this. And it's now uh, three years I've done that. So I, I keep supporting the community and trying to be of service to people uh, who are going through a challenging time. It can be from burnout, loneliness, or people naturally who's going through uh, divorces, for example, if they need someone to talk to, I'm trying to be there. That's pretty heavy. And I'm sorry that you had to experience all of that on your side. And from your friend, I know someone close to me uh, killed themselves in June. And that was a massive shock because it, there was just no sign at all. And um, it's really destroyed his family. And uh, that's that's been very difficult to watch because they they're very sweet people and and very loving. Um, so if someone were to feel this way, what's something that they can do? Assuming they're not in Singapore and have access to this agency, like what's something that they could do to try to alleviate those symptoms, those those feelings? There's so many beautiful anonymous and uh, volunteer organizations there there's always a hotline for everything it doesn't matter what challenge or issue there is and there's so many community services uh, so many wonderful charities and organizations that are there to help each other so my first message is that if someone feeling not right you know first think of is there someone in my family a friend a colleague i can share this with Otherwise, it's just going to Google and look up. There will be in every country, every community, something, someone will be there. Or find a coach, find a mentor, or find a therapist. The worst thing is to go to bed at night with that feeling of not feeling well and not sharing it with someone. What I found through my whole journey here is that basically the problem is halved once you share it with someone. And it doesn't matter normally who it is. It's just by the fact you vocalize it to another human being. Do you guys talk about this at EGN? Do you feel like any of the executives or founders might have this kind of pressure? Or? Yes, we do. And uh, I mean, being vulnerable as a leader is something that I'm speaking a lot about. And we're encouraging the members to be vulnerable with each other. The peer group meeting in itself is not specifically about the mental health side of it, but we do cover it and we do encourage them to speak up if they have a challenge. Uh, uh, and also the fact that I'm the founder and the leader of this organization, everyone in EGN knows that I had my journey. Uh, in fact, I put it in a book, so it's a little bit difficult for me to remove it. It's called Executive Loneliness. It's on Amazon, it's on Audible, and I'm not here to promote my book, but uh, I put down my story here. I put my uh, challenges I went through and my friend's suicide, his story is in here. And uh, I wanted to spread it with the world because I, I don't want other people to go through what I went through, or even worse, what my friend and his family went through. We can't stop this if we just talk to each other. I agree. The world is a very lonely place these days. I think social media uh, made it worse. I think COVID m made it obvious. And now it's time we figure out how to actually deal with it instead of sweeping it under the rug, especially in Asia. Especially in Asia, I discovered people are really, really afraid to be vulnerable and talk about what they're truly feeling. Absolutely, Sean, you're right here. I mean, I see now in all the like the grassroots organizations where I'm a volunteer, uh, the locals are not coming back into the rooms yet. They doesn't mean that they don't have issues. It means that they're still not coming back out and joining. Uh, there's still this fear that there's a pandemic there. And sadly, this is, uh, you know, blocking, giving people the perfect excuse to isolate themselves. Uh, so I hope soon that this is over and everyone will come out and gather together and talking to each other rather than sitting home being sad, depressed and isolated. Well, thank you for sharing your story, Nick. I appreciate it. If you want to know more about his story, you can check out his book. I'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you want to 
do an actual race, then you need to practice every day. And if you want to run a company, you need to practice every day. I, I find so many parallels to uh, business and dating or business and, and training or pretty much everything. Business is everything, <laughs> pretty much. There, there, if there's a lesson in business, there's a lesson in life and they're intertwined very deeply. So uh, thank you very much, Nick. Yes, and thank you so much, Sean, for having me on the show and for talking about these topics, which full a bit uh, of stigma and many people are avoiding them. So uh, hats off and credit to you for covering this. The, the podcast for me has always been about psychology and entrepreneurship, where there's a lot of things that go on that people don't talk about, but those are the realities of entrepreneurship. And if we don't talk about those things, which are based on psychology, then we will not become better entrepreneurs, which means we will not become better leaders, which means we will not become better people, which means we will not build a better society. So for me, psychology and entrepreneurship are deeply intertwined and people need to be able to be vulnerable in order to unlock the best power parts of themselves.